part of a lecture series on homelessness that uh, some of the fast streamers across government are running. And we're very pleased to have Anne Wilmot here today um, from Business Action in, uh, on Homelessness to talk to us a little bit about homelessness and work connections and things like that. So I think the plan is to talk for about 20 minutes maybe, and then there'll be opportunities for questions at the end. So, so do think of, of what you'd like to ask Anne. Um, and also a plug, we are fundraising to you, of course, as you, I'm sure, are all aware. Um, so if anybody would like to donate anything to Business Action on homelessness or crisis, there's pots around, so um, feel free to do that. Thanks very much for coming. So, yeah, I'll hand over. Great. Thanks very much, Jackie. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this, Augusta. I can sit, spy Stephen Hall up in Sheffield there, who, um, who has sort of put my name through to, to Jacqueline. So thank you very much. It's lovely to see the team up in Sheffield uh, joining us today as, as well. Um, I was with uh, the Plan A director of Marks and Spencers a few weeks ago, and he talked about a similar gathering that he was speaking at. And um, he had a couple of pe people in the room. He was talking about his sustainability and Marks and Spencer stuff. And out of the corner of his eye, he spied um, both um, Al Gore and Steven Spielberg. And I have to say, I have a similar sense of trepidation today with the, you know, the sort of caliber of the audience I've got here and the expertise collectively around the room. So um, I look forward to your questions, and I, I don't know whether I'll be able to do them justice, but I'll give it, uh, give it a go. Um, uh, as Jackie said, I'm, I'm Wilmot from Business in the Community, and I sort of lead our, our, camp I'm our campaign director for our work inclusion programs. Um, some of you all have heard of Business in the Community. I suspect most of you haven't. Um, but we are an organisation that really sponsors, uh, looked, is about responsible business and we have a membership of about 850 companies. You'll see the logos of the companies that are members, many of those I suspect you'll recognise uh, those logos. Uh, and they employ between them about one in five the UK population, adult population. Um, work in these things and we also work internationally as well. We've probably got about two or three thousand companies who are involved in our programs both in the UK and another about eight thousand with our partner organisations around the world and it's, it's really good to see that the UK really sort of uh, le leads the way in terms of responsible business practice and sort of really is the work that we and a number of other companies in the UK have done have really sort of then sort of spawned some of that sectors developing in other countries around the UK across the world in fact. Um, we are one part of what we do in business in the community. We have a sort of like five ambitions and prayers where we work with our sort of companies, whether that's helping in terms of education, enterprise, our work on work inclusion, there's some environmental and sustainability stuff that we do, and also about workplace. But I think because I was in DWP, I thought it'd be helpful to talk about the work that we do about tackling unemployment, and particularly those with significant barriers to face in gaining and sustaining employment. Um, I guess the first question is what's the needs and what, why have we got in, involved in that? Um, so there's, as, as you all know, better than we do because you produce the figures, there's about 2.3 million people who are unemployed in the UK. And what we've been seeing over the last few years and a really increasing number of those people who've got multiple barriers to work. And that will include things like um, having experience of homelessness, being through the care system, having an unspent criminal conviction, maybe having low skills needs, low skills, English may not be your first language, or often and most likely a combination of those things. Maybe you've had also issues with drugs, alcohol, health issues as well. And I was going to face particularly about people who work on homeless, who, who are homeless, but also recognising that homelessness is almost like a sort of a huge sort of category. And people, it's for a whole range of people with a whole range of sort of different issues, uh, and not just uh, people who maybe so street, uh, sleeping off on the streets of the UK. Um, interesting as research shows, out of those people who have been homeless, 70%, 77%, so over three quarters of people who are homeless want to work. Yet, concerningly, only 5% are working now. 17% um, of the people have also got a criminal conviction. And you'll see that that has quite an impact. Not being in work really reduces people's impact to get it go sort of in terms of reoffending. And over half of people who've been in the care system have no qualifications. But maybe more concerning uh, concerns us more than that, even that, would be that only nine percent of our clients are currently on the work programme. And bearing in mind um, that seventy percent of our clients have been unemployed for over a year that difference and describes that the people when they come to us say they're not on the work program really quite concerns us. Now of course some people have been through two years on the work program and are now returning to other support through the job centres. Um, and but it's still concerned that gap really still very much concerns us. Um, 
particularly as our clients aren't necessarily sort of chaotic drug users or got multiple, you know, into chaotic phase of drug use or are chaotic sort of other health issues, um, we're really quite concerned that the provision that's out there, it really isn't touching uh, the experiences of the people who are going through our programme. So, so what are we doing at it? Um, we've, got a pro we've developed over the last 10 years a programme called Ready for Work. I would love to say that sort of when we started it back in 2001, we had a fully fledged programme, we knew exactly what we were doing, but I have to say we just kind of, I know this has been taped, but we somewhat uh, came into this slightly sort of by accident. Um, and it came, a program came about. Um, we had one of our member companies, Bain, a company, a, a consultancy firm who some of you all heard of, moved into really new offices on the Strand, a beautiful glass atrium. Their nearest neighbours were people who were sleeping rough out on the streets just in front of their building. And I guess they probably thought, oh, this isn't terribly good for trade. Um, and rather than going to Westminster City Council and saying, can you deal with this issue? They said, well, does business have a role to play here? And to be honest, we weren't really quite sure. But what we did was we got groups of business leaders and took them on what we call seeing as believing trips to visit, talk to hostels and other homelessness organisations and other organisations in London to say, what do you think? Is there anything that business could be doing here? Um, and by hook no hook, we took probably about 200 different business leaders around, um, around on these visits. And it, well, late in the day, we realised that actually the best thing that companies could do to help people was to help people get a job. So other people were much better placed than we were to be able to help people with maybe drugs and alcohol and health issues. But the really thing that business could do differently was help people along their journey to employability. So somewhat naively, um, we got a group of many financial companies in the City of London and solicitors, accountants, to offer work placements to people who'd experienced homelessness who were referred to us by homeless hostels. And I think to everybody's surprise, um, two thirds of people finished their two week work placement. And some even got jobs. And we thought, this kind of surprised us a bit, but actually we thought, well, then only that means only one third of people don't get jobs so, and don't finish their placement. We need to do something there. So we teamed up with an organisation and put in place pre placement training in place. And that improved people getting jobs as well. That was great. And then we realised that what happens with those people who finish their work placement came out on a really huge high. Um, but then didn't get a job straight away. And it, about sort of 10 years ago, I don't know if any of you were involved in this, where uh, is actually people coaching as a sort of management tool became quite sort of fashionable. Um, I think one or two of you have probably been through the sort of that sort of kind of process. Um, I thought, actually, do you know, do you think this might actually work? You know, if we get matched everybody up with a job coach who finished their placement, do you think that might help? And I, yeah, it did. And so numbers again increased. And then uh, Marks and Spencers came along and said, look, it's great you're doing this in London, but we'd like to launch something nationally across the UK. Um, and we thought, great, and we want to put 500 people through a year, and this time we were only, at this time we were only doing about 50 people in the first year kind of thing. So being a charity, you never say never, particularly when one comes up with a big cash you know, and wants to do masses more stuff. So we got, you know, and, and we started launching across the UK. Um, fast forward to now, we've now helped 7,700 people through the programme. Uh, we've over 3,000 people have now get jobs and you'll see that our sustainability work, uh, rates are in terms of what we measure and people who getting jobs are, is pretty good although I guess we'll see, okay, that's something we continually sort of want to work with we've got about 150 companies supporting the program they do so by offering work placements they offer job coaching <coughs> they offer health host training they help financially and they provide jobs and it's been really great to see say the team the Birmingham team of Job Centre Plus offering us offering job coaches and again that's something that's very much open to people at DWP um, so you, in terms of job coaching you work with an individual you we train people up as job coaches about coaching Coaching, but also how you apply sort of classic coaching tools to working with a particular client group and really understanding you know what your role is as a job coach and what other supports out there to support those people and then we meet up with your job your coachee for a period of up to about six months on a weekly basis um, and then help those people really specifically with their work focus stuff at helping get a job recognizing there's others people out there who can help people with for example uh, any sort of housing issues maybe benefits issues and things and making sure that people get signposted to the support that's available out there and we're looking to support about 4,000 people into work by 2016 and we're on track to do that 
Uh, we've got 140 of those businesses are actually actively involved in the Ready for Work programme and we're now operating in 20 cities across the UK. And we really would like to scale that up. Bain and um, Accenture have done some work so we can scale the programme by about six times if we had the sort of support in terms of finance and uh, other things to help us to do that. Um, what do our employees say about it? You can see that, yes, getting people into work is fantastic, but also there's, there's the reciprocal benefits um, to the companies. And it, this has been really interesting, seeing how our volunteers, we've got sort of about 1,800 volunteers who have actually benefited from the programme, how that, the skills that they've learned from either hosting a work placement or uh, being, on, um, being a job coach have really helped people develop quite sort of tangible things which people have then been able to use in their terms of their personal and professional development. So that's a little bit about what we do to help people gain and sustain work. Um, the other things, a couple of things I just want to mention as, as part of what we do is great that actually we're sort of helping individuals into work. I'm very conscious compared with the scale of stuff that DWP does, we're really only touching the sides. Um, I would love to see DWP commissioning its programmes in a slightly different way. Most of our funding comes from businesses. Um, DCLG has provided funding in the past. We, we've really struggled to get the work programme in terms of the contracting arrangements working for us. But probably more than importantly than that is really a, a number of the companies would really like to scale what they do but they really struggle to uh, interface well with the work programme providers. The fact that you've got 16 sort of contract package areas around the UK and uh, companies, particularly national employers, want to really engage off the same programme across the UK. So what I would love to see in the design of work pro uh, programme 2 would be to have some sort of national commissioning of um, charities and companies so that we could actually scale up what we do. Um, and that just sort of kind of makes sense in terms of actually really sort of leveraging in corporate engagement. And I guess why I think that's more important, irrespective of sort of, you, you expect me as a charity <laughs> to say things like that, I see some wise smiles around the room. Um, but why I think it's important is there's just such a huge need for it in terms of people to gain and sustain employment. Um, I, if you've seen the form results, we outperform, I think, probably the best work, work programme for a charity. It feels like a missed opportunity here. And we really would like to give the opportunity to our, give them more opportunity for our clients to be able, and the people who are affected by homelessness, to gain and sustain employment. Work is obviously quite a transformative catalyst for not just getting to work, coming off benefits, but has so many other impacts on people's sort of lives. So that was something. And the other critical thing is, I think particularly whether the economy is going through wherever we are in the business cycle, why this is really important is that our clients need to get jobs on their own merits. They don't get special privileges. So we need to persuade employers to employ someone with a background of homelessness who might have a very checkered employment record. Give that a job to somebody above somebody who's currently employed or who has recently been unemployed. So what's the business case for somebody who takes who might be perceived as unreliable or you know, you know hasn't got a proven track record, may have sort of lesser sort of educational qualifications, maybe concern, people, concerns about people's health. What's going to make that company take a risk to employ that individual? And I, I, I think sort of why I think it's important to uh, sort of run programmes like this is that actually the best chance an individual has to sort of break coming parachuting themselves to the top of the list is being able to demonstrate their skills and abilities in front of an employer. Because often they'll get you know, screened out at the sort of CV selection stage and won't even make it to interview. So, but if you've had two weeks sitting, you know, working in a team at Marks and Spencers or Royal Mail or Carillion or wherever, and you've proven you've turned up every single day, you've proved you've been a good member of that team and, and, and really contributed to that business, the chances are that you, you know, that's, and you have a certificate that says I've been, you know, spent two weeks at Marks and Spencers or whatever. That's the thing which is going to sort of move you up the food chain, basically, and increase your chances of getting a job. So that's why I'm really keen on sort of getting employers involved in, in programmes like this. It's actually critical, not just the success of our programme, which is a, they're always going to be relatively small in the scheme of things, but getting em employers involved in what the work that DWP does is absolutely critical, I think, in terms of getting people, more people back into work and fulfilling the strategy that you know, DWP's overall uh, social justice and overall strategy. That seems critical um, to me. Um, and then 
the other thing I'd like to just talk about a little bit is about some of the, as well as helping people into work through programmes, I think the other thing is actually sort of, it's actually challenging employers about some of the structural barriers that they may put in place, maybe inadvertently, to that stop people getting work. And I just want to share very briefly about our Ban the Box programme. And this was something that came out from discussions with employers, um, which was saying actually something like, about two thirds of employers will, will turn somebody down with an unspent conviction, and that will do that at that recruitment stage. So you'll have, have seen that when you, I guess, when you've been applying for jobs yourselves, where there's a tick. Many employers will put something on their application forms to say, um, "Have you got a, a criminal conviction?" And many of those companies, if you tick that box, yes, will automatically screen you out. And obviously, with more, more people in. Um, recruiting online, often that's just done before anybody's even actually got to, in front of an employer. So what we were saying to employers is, yes, you need to take your appropriate risk management processes and recognising that some roles are regulated and you have to do checks. But actually, you think about taking off that default tick box off your application and assessing people on their merit and skills and abilities to be able to do the job first. And then only asking about and making your policies clear about what what your policy is about taking people on with unspent convictions. Because a lot of people who've been in prison or have got other unspent criminal convictions will actually self-select. They won't even apply for a job because they think you might might screen them out. So why why they'll see you screen them out? So we're saying, look, make that decision, but make it be very clear about what your recruitment policy is about people employing people with unspent convictions. And then make that decision later on in the recruitment process, once you've seen the has an opportunity to see people and see what they're capable of. And at least that gives them people an opportunity to disclose and disclose in a way that kind of gives the contextual factors, which might have had quite a significant impact in why they did what they did. And also to say what might have changed in the many, often many years since that uh, offence actually happened. So we have, we only launched this in the autumn, it's had some about 70,000 additional hits on our website as a result of it, which is quite good when we, our overall website only gets sort of 40,000 a month. Uh, we've had our first eight employers, including the likes of Boots, Freshfields, Land Securities, Interserf, who've already banned the box and taken it off their recruitment, which is great. Many, many others who, interestingly, have done it, but don't want to be in the public domain about it, and that shows there's still some campaigning work to, to do around that agenda. Um, and I'm just wondering, a, a number of government departments here, does, does, how, how many of your departments have tick boxes when you apply for civil service? And do people get screened out automatically if they tick that box? It's included sometimes on diversity forms, so it's not used as part of the screening process, but so we can monitor it. So that's positive way of doing it. Is that the same across all government departments, or do you do each do your own thing? My, my, my challenge is I would love a government department to actually stand up and back ban the box and actually be, join our list of sort of champion companies because I, I mean, particularly and also both in terms of recruitment but also um, in terms of actually procurement. I know people, the number of people come here uh, for defence procurement in a, one way or another. Uh, it would be really interesting to see in terms of procurement strategies what, your, what contractual things you put in place in terms of who's working on contracts. And is there an opportunity for different government departments to think about in your procurement strategies what constraints you're putting on uh, the people, your, your, your suppliers? Now, I understand in some cases there'll be some huge sensitivities, but are there some department departments where actually, not for all roles, it's absolutely essential that people have gone through sort of full disclosure or have an unspent you know, Is it okay that some might have an unspent conviction or a spent conviction? Maybe that's just, just something I'd love to be able to talk to if you can let. Lead me, uh, you link me up with anybody to talk about, just explore that and just understand that more, that would be really good. And then to close, I um, don't know whether you might be aware, how many of you are already aware of this, but uh, we're lucky enough to be working on a joint partnership with you called Generation Talent. And we've got a couple of people from DWP who seconded to us for a period of two years, Mandy and Rachel. And we're really looking to sort of try to work with yourselves um, to get more employers to take on young people. It's about a number of tools and things like that. So leveraging sort of how the BITC membership, linking in with, uh, through Mandy and, uh, and through Rachel into Lee Miller's team. And we, that's really exciting. We're doing some work. One thing I'm not sure it's just been launched is we've developed a kind of self-assessment tool for companies, which 
I think going, which, when we get some more data, we've had about 50 companies, large companies, <coughs> filling in so far. But actually analysing that data as a questionnaire about what companies are doing around what, what vacancies they open up to young people, what pro pro positive action they take. Uh, and that's looking quite interesting. The thing I was going to find very interesting is when we see the sort of analysis of the data there to see who's the aggregated data that comes through that survey. And then the opportunities for Mandy and, and uh, Rachel to link up with the sort of employment team at DWP to look at new opportunities so people could make sure they're advertising their vacancies through Job Centre Plus uh, through, um, and also have, take advantage of the other services that you offer. So that's, I think, is probably, I'll just show you just, the, just to finish, the companies where we're working on that, which is, again, a good group of uh, employers across the public and the private sectors. So I think that's probably all I was looking to talk about. I'm now with some trepidation sort of um, up for your questions. <laughs> Have you got an office in Dublin? Is yes, we have. Right? We run uh, Ready for Work in Dublin. Yes. Does that cover? Is it the whole of the island of Ireland? Uh, we focus mainly in Dublin, actually, yeah. um, because of sort of concentration of people and also uh, sort of support services there. I'd love to go. We'd uh, love to go wider, sort of to call Waterford, sort of um, out west as well. But yes, need some partners and and uh, and support from the sort of uh, Irish government, I think, on that. Yeah. When it comes to convincing businesses to join to join this program, what have you found to be the biggest challenge in in persuading them? What what are they most reluctant about? That's interesting. Um, I think it's changed over the sort of last few years. Um, so currently, often it's not having vacancies. Although that's not been as probably as big a problem as you would expect. Actually, our inter work rates haven't dipped very much at all over the last four or five years. Um, I think the critical thing is about managing the risk and potential risk uh, in terms of um, thinking of t letting people into their business who might have had criminal convictions or th they people you know like all of us have got various stereotypes around what somebody's homeless might be particularly if you haven't worked with homeless people before or who you know people who use drugs and things like that or use drugs or things like that so actually managing the risk and persuading them that we can support them in terms of managing that risk and understanding their business is probably the biggest barrier Yeah, yeah. We're really lucky. We've got about two hundred and eighty homeless projects around the UK in each of our cities, and we try and work with as any organisation where we're based. We, we, you know, we, we, you know, who wants to refer their clients can. We have some referral criteria, um, so people can't self-refer. Uh, we don't take people who sleep are sleeping rough at the moment because people have got more, much more immediate needs to deal with. So we um, have some particular criteria so to suggest that people are kind of ready and able to take on, on board this programme. So if people have been, for example, a drug user, um, that they've been in treatment or on a recognised treatment programme for, and that's working okay for the last sort of three months. And we also get their key worker or the support worker to say, both as individuals to sign up but also their key workers as well say look this is the right program because the last thing we want people to do is drop out of the program most of the people on the program have experienced repeated failure and things in their lives and we we know if people fall out we send their confidence levels back down not just to when they start us back or, but, but lower than that because we just reinforce that cycle of failure so what we try and do and it's really the skill of the ready for work manager who's on the ground there the client and also the uh, the key worker to work out is this program is this program right for you right now if it's not fine go off and do something else for the next few months water delighted for you to come back to us but come back when you're ready um, and I guess the thing is we were saying it costs a certain amount of money to put people through this kind of program um, so and we're making an investment in people we think we're doing it because we think you, you this is the right program for you and you think this is the right for, program for you we want you to succeed we won't promise you a job but we want you to. We want to give it our best shot to get you through. We want to give the almost like I guess our ethos is really to say: Can we give the, the pastoral support, the quality pastoral support that the voluntary sector its best can do, married with the kind of professionalism of the private sector its best and the values of the public sector its best? Can we that create that kind of an al sort of alchemy around the program to, to, with the individual, give people the best opportunity to succeed? 
sorry, do you, do you allow re enrolment to the programme? We used to, that's a really interesting question. We, we thought giving people lots of offer shots at this was actually a really good thing. Then we analysed all the data and realised that people actually didn't, they went through a second time, didn't necessarily get further than they did the first time. We don't fully understand that. I mean, we've got limited places available in the programme, but actually, we'd expected giving people a second or third shot might be good. It seems to work with younger people on other programmes we run, giving people multiple opportunities. But for this programme, it, we don't seem to, it doesn't seem to translate into better results. So we've kind of said, actually, this, you've got one go at this. Well, so, so what happens to uh, participants actually in that programme? They don't get an outcome. Yep. Um, and, and subsequently, do you monitor them afterwards, or they just go back? Or uh, is there sort of activities that you look or your uh, people look at for those folks that have yeah. kind of not succeeded? Yeah, and we can, if they don't finish their placement, they can still have a job coach, they can still come to our Ready for Work Club, that's absolutely fine. The critical thing is we link them back to make sure they're still working with a key worker so that people who can then sort them out with other provision and so something more suitable. Because we don't want to leave anybody high and dry. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and, it, and really sort of, we will keep the doors open to people as long as it's, you know, appropriate for that, you know, for as long as they want us to be, support them. This is not really a question, it's such a form of observation. I mean, I work on our volunteer program, the community 10,000 program. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Mm. And um, I've recently got involved with an organisation called the House of St. Barnabas. Oh, yes, yes, in, in Soho. Street. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was just more of the fact that I ended up getting involved because they wanted us to run a one-day interview with students. Yes. And it's just about as much as anything rather than just techniques of just building up confidence. And what struck me was, was actually these people that were selected for this programme, it's about eight of them over yeah. a twelve week period of time. And similar to what I guess yes. you do. Yeah, the cohorts, yes. Um, more to do with sort of catering, etc. Yep. But rather than sort of going to McDonald's or whatever, they're actually using their, their, their the building that they've got as a charity. It's a social enterprise, isn't it? Yes. Private, yeah. private part members yes. part. And they're getting their work experience by actually being part of the programme, being part of doing the work during the evenings, etc. And it just reminded me about the fact that you know sometimes we can step, we can have sort of these blinkers that actually some people not step up, but actually by putting them into a much quite luxurious environment yes. and making them feel better about themselves by simply doing things like that can make such a big difference. It does. And exactly, you know, the outcomes, their aspirations, I'm sure, wouldn't sort of be. Uh, I think that's a really helpful observation. I think it's really true. Very true. And that's yeah. why these, I suppose, these people need help for that. There's a way to be identified with them, aren't Yeah, I'm, and it's interesting. It's, 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 I guess as, as many people at House of St Barnabas, they wouldn't have thought, oh, you know, I can work at a you know, high-end members club. Same thing, well, why will Marks and Spencers get, like, take on the likes of me? Or why will, can I, you know, if I go down to Barclays at Canary Wharf, you know, that in itself is quite a daunting experience kind of thing um, for many of us. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, and, this, and it, so that, that's quite interesting. It challenges perceptions both ways, actually. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Any questions from Sheffield? Cool. Yeah, a couple of things. It's uh, Australia, I've seen the counterpart on, uh, on, on the artist side, and they're talking about the fact that they don't Yes, nine percent. Yes, and do you have a sense of what portion of your clients are, are eligible for the work program? Well, we um, know, yeah, and this, is, yeah, I broadly it should be about um, seventy percent should be. I, I don't know what percentage of people have gone through the program and now should be sort of work quo return, work returners, but that will cut it down slightly to that, um, and will increasingly maybe do so. But when we did the figures about that was just before the work programs and returners sort of kicked in kind of thing. So at that time it was seventy percent. And do you, do you know roughly how many of them are actually in contact with Job Centre Plus to, to get referred to the work program? Any any sense there? No, not at all, no. I mean, there's an element where that we could see that people may say that they're not on the work programme because they think they may not be able to come on our programme. And a few things like that could potentially. But it's interesting when you sort of probe a little bit further how little contact people have had with prime contractors or subcontractors. Um, and yes, that could be two years ago, um, but it, it's interesting how little support people seem to have had, sadly. Okay, thank you. Um, the other one was just around um, any evaluation evidence you have once you place people into jobs and how, how they get on, um, particularly 
particular, I guess, those people that sustain. So if you're, you're getting a higher, a high proportion of people sustaining, then that's then something we can work to say. But once you take on people, it can work for you. Um, is that something? That yes. Better publicising. Yeah, I mean, seventy-five percent of our clients sustain work for at least three months. Um, Fifty-nine percent of people sustain work for at least six months. We do keep tracking after th that sort of period. Um, many of our clients, though, we don't choose to keep in contact after that period. So we do keep tracking. We know for every pound invested in the program, we get a three pound twelve return on investment over a five-year period. We were very lucky to work with you, your, you guys at DWP to help us work out what metrics we should use and to uh, get our heads around all the benefits stuff and to, to make sure we sort of calculate in a hopefully a, a robust kind of way. And what about employer feedback when they take people on? Like that? Yeah, I mean, it re really sort of positive. Um, there's limited studies on that that we've seen. Employers don't necessarily do particular sort of comparative studies. Uh, the one that always springs to mind, and it's probably because it's one of the few ones that have been done, is Marks and Spencers, and they looked at kind of attrition rates and compared the people on Marks and Start, which is homelessness, um, lone parents, it's a well-known programme, Prince's Trust for young people, and sort of gingerbread um, and employ, um, is that attrition rates are lower for Marks and Start clients than they are by about two percentage points than for their overall Marks and Spencers workforce. Uh, but that data is actually fairly limited um, in terms of numbers of companies who are actually analysing that, that kind of, of, of comparative data in that debt that, say, Marks and Spencers has done, sadly. Thank you. Any more? I'm, I'm interested to know a bit more about what you do to support the employer. So how much can you offer to support? Yeah, I think the, the employees, we support the employers as much as we do the clients. Um, and that's critical in terms of upfront to really understand their business um, and practical things about where it could work and you know, how they will be able to support their clients through the program, what will work in terms of their business cycles. So needless to say, with people like Royal Mail, Marks and Spencers, we try and skew their placements towards sort of July, September, October time, because the most hit peak recruitment. We also need to be quite conscious about what roles will work best for employers. So for example, I'm going back to Marks and Spencers again, but for example, we don't till train people through the program. Uh, we also try and make sure that people benefit from what other training programs. So in Marks and Spencers, people go through this sort of standard training program with coaching cards and things like that, which is, gives them advantage in terms of if they get a job there as well. Uh, we train all the buddies, so each person when they work placement will have a, a workplace buddy. Uh, we'll also have a company coordinator as well, to, because we, and really support them to help their select the right placements in their company. Uh, at a national level, particularly for our companies, we have a, a board of business leaders who again coordinate all that side as well and help us with the strategic direction of the program. And we also, for our larger companies, we set them targets each year as well. And we'll sit, literally plan say we'll have X people in Sheffield, we'll have X people in this program in Nottingham. And so we actually plan out a programme for the year to make it easy for them to then align it with their business issues and things like that. And then for people when they're on the placement, we're always at as the backline support if anything happens on the placement or for in a job coaching relationship, we provide similar training for coaches as well. Um, and then we give lots of feedback about metrics, what's working, what's not, how annual reviews and all those kind of things, formal kind of things. We've actually found that actually the, if you help companies, actually it's really worth investing in as much time in investing with companies as it is with the so clients, and that really makes the program work kind of better in terms of actually getting the better outcomes from the clients. So, and I would, and I guess I, I would love to see that replicated more widely, maybe at DWP, and sort of giving uh, opportunities for the sort of companies as well. So, um, I really love the work that sort of Lee Miller's team is doing with employers um, and I think there's opportunities to really scale that work. And I guess the thing I've sort of thinking is most of the companies we work with they don't want to say support the work program or support say apprenticeships or support traineeships or the latest graduate engineering push or something like that. They want to help people with a disadvantage into work. Um, it's less related to a government program uh, rather, but more helping make a difference on a specific social issue. 
that seems critical element. And actually, one of the challenges, that, uh, there's a lovely slide that um, CBI did, showed about this 27 current initiatives that business, the government wants business to be involved in around training and skills and employment. So a lot of people say, where do I start? Do they want me to do apprenticeships? Do they want me to do traineeship? Do they want me to take homeless people into work? Do they want me to do as what the work programme? And that kind of navigating your way through that and working out what's right for your business is it's a full-time job in itself. And many companies, I suspect, particularly smaller companies, really struggle to do that. And large companies are really struggle, struggle with it too. Thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for your help with your questions.